another draft physics presentation such so also they slipped a rather long comment that I've sort of broken into pieces and I'll go through some of it um, my simple argument here is that doing this science thing is first about collecting evidence and then you basically have a trial you have different theories explaining the evidence and you sort of put them on trial. You say how well do they fit the evidence, how much, how many catastrophic inconsistencies do they have with the evidence, all this kind of balancing of the evidence supporting and um, rejecting a theory. I mean there's evidence that is, um, <laughs> these should be simple words, that support and then evidence that doesn't support theories. You know, um, probably some better word for evidence that doesn't support a theory, you know, evidence catastrophic to the theory, dangerous to the theory, destructive to the theory being true. And you have to balance those two things, and you balance them for both theories. And the idea is that you fairly judge the two things, so you don't sit there and allow one theory to have a whole bunch of made-up stuff, like made-up dimensions and made-up magical forces and made-up other stuff, and then you don't allow the other theory to have any made-up stuff in it. And my accusation is to these people who are judging the theory I've presented is that they're being completely hypocritical and duplicitous in the sense that as judges they're not doing a fair evaluation. They definitely have a preference, a prejudice towards the establishment because all the big eggheads say so or whatever the reason is. They're very impressed with the current theory or the, the mechanism that created it. Even though I've pointed out how that mechanism um, whitewashes and propagandizes a lot, <laughs> you know, an incredible amount um, in terms of saying things have been proven. Like, yo, then Young came along and proved light was a wave, when that's not really what happened. Uh, nothing even close to that happened. Um, uh, you know, just it just it's just propaganda. It's just this glorification. Eddington proved Einstein right, and you know that didn't happen. Uh, nowhere near the standard that should have been expected for you to say that that's a conclusion that's already written in stone and now we can just move on and say that's a fact. It's not a fact. And anyway, so there's a whole bunch of this. And but anyway, so all I'm saying is, is I don't think these people are honest judges. That's my accusation, is that the critics haven't been honest judges. They haven't honestly picked. And... Um, are degraded, are um, acknowledged. And it's really obvious when I say something like the evidence is weak, and I point to the weak evidence, and they still won't concede that yes, the evidence isn't strong evidence. Nowhere near the standard that should be confidence. And I even say things like, you know, they've jumped the evidence. They won't even admit that any of that has happened. Um, and, you know, I'm just saying they're kind of. Uh, to me, it's obvious that they can't fairly judge. Um, their bias is obvious. So anyway, um, so anyway, that's all I'm saying. Is I just want a fair process, and I'm just saying it's it's quite clear to me that this process isn't fair. So okay, life's unfair. I'm accepting that. Um, I'm just saying that you're not fooling me. <laughs> I know you got the fix in. You're not a fair jury, and if you ever to reach a determination, it's not going to be a fair judgment. So, you know, you, you're just outing the system as being exactly what I said it is, broken, and that's why it hasn't fixed the problem already internally. That's why the scientists didn't already fix this. It's because they don't have any mechanism to do it. Because it's a confirmation engine, it's not people looking for the truth. They're not trying to fairly judge the facts. They're trying to make the facts fit the theory they are defending. And that's it that simple sort of so anyway I wrote up my own little a few little jibber jabber statements that maybe I'll read at the end of this uh, basically just saying what I just said in somewhat different language I suppose as a counter argument to this this is essentially a philosophy um, document by Hafaday it doesn't really deal with any of the facts it just deals with why we somehow should accept that the system is working when I would argue how can you even say it works when you have absolutely nothing to compare it to. It's like saying religion worked when we could have been maybe 500 years ahead of where we are now technologically 
if it wasn't for religion. You don't know those answers. So it's just silly to say it works when you don't have anything to compare it to. Like how much better it would work if they didn't have all the wrong assumptions built into their uh, theory. All right, so anyway, um, so I'll read some of this and we'll see where it goes. Uh, what I take from this video is on the one hand, you are in your theory assuming the existence of matter bits. Again, it's this, uh, this argument that I'm assuming something because I've assumed the existence of protons and electrons. So again, it's just this, what, what have I, where, where have I reached for an assumption? There's a ton of evidence that there's two polarized bits called electrons and protons. I don't really have to defend that as just being something of an assumption. I'm saying I'm accepting the existence of these things we've identified as protons and electrons. Yes. I'm assuming all the science related to protons and electrons is a complete rubbish. Yes but I'm not doing something where I'm making assumptions. I'm accepting the current assumptions. Fuck. Anyway. And while open to suggestion on how they work, again, I don't even know what that even means. We already know how they work in the sense of what they do. Now, why they do it, again, your physics has no explanation, so let's not pretend you have some understanding of how electrons and protons work when in my opinion, your theory still hasn't figured out that they're polarized <laughs> entities, that they're essentially the magnetic monopole. You haven't even figured out what I would consider to be obvious. Um, or while you are prepared to have a go at proposed possible ways, if whatever, again, I, I, it's not, obviously I'm prepared to do it because I'm saying that you have to explain how they function, and physics doesn't do that. They don't have any explanations for what moves an electron or what moves a proton. They just say it's probably some sort of energy moving between them. <laughs> that's And you say that's good enough. Now, if I said something like that, you'd say, well, what do you mean there's some energy? That's magical. So that's what I mean by the double standard. If I said, look, they just move and interact, blah, 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 whatever, virtual, virtual. That's, that's, what's, that's physics explanation. If I said that, you'd crucify me. Frankly, I'd be dead right there in the courtroom. You'd just shoot me and say, you can't say that. You can't do that. That's a magical explanation. Anyway, you are not going to consider it a problem for your model. Well, I'm obviously not going to consider it a problem in the sense that I have a model <laughs> that actually does explain magnetism and does explain gravity and does explain nuclear forces, and it does it with one mechanism. So clearly, why would I think it's a problem? I mean, obviously the, the, <laughs> the suggestion I've given for a function works in a sense that it creates a unification theory, something your side doesn't have. Uh, at least one that's rational, that doesn't have magic in it. Um, this is fine, so whatever. So again, this is just a, I, I mean, what? it's not rude, but I just mean it's just, just what, what is this? You paraphrase what I'm doing, and then I have to restate it again, that no, that's not exactly what I'm doing here. I'm not making up something by suggesting there's protons and electrons. I'm not making up something by suggesting they have opposite charges. And I'm not certainly not making up something by certainly saying, ah, well, the reason why that charge thing is important is because the field of energy around them is also polarized. Yes, that's what makes it all work. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I didn't really understand this was your position previously. So again, I don't even know if I can agree with his paraphrase of my position. Uh, again, I don't know why he's saying something's not a problem. You are not going to consider it a problem for your model. Sort of implying that I'm saying my model doesn't need to answer questions, which I certainly didn't say. And I've already created so much more detail than their model. So again, he's implying that somehow my model is weaker on these subjects than their model. And then saying, well, you're accepting some weaknesses. You don't have all the details. They don't have any of the details. <laughs> you know, I have at least 50% more detail. And then he's telling me, well, you've accepted not having 100% detail. They have 0% detail. This is what I mean by the obvious duplicity of standards here. All right. Um, <clears throat> This makes, to my mind, uh, your theory wholly qualitative. So we're going to be careful of these two words, quantitative and qualitative, as if this is the way you describe something, which I don't really understand, uh, frankly. 
um, quality and quantity are two different things. Um, a lot of bad evidence isn't make it good evidence. Uh, you know, I mean, we all kind of know that you don't need much really good evidence, like genetic evidence. You don't need much of it because it's really strong evidence, that kind of thing. So qualitative, quantitative arguments, in my opinion, are they're just not useful conversation. There's no, there's no general way to understand the, this, these terms as if they mean something. The balance is between being consistent with the evidence and catastrophically inconsistent with evidence. So what you're trying to avoid is a catastrophic inconsistency with a piece of evidence. You know, something like the DNA doesn't match, um, where everything else does match. You know, fingerprints, everything else matches, the DNA doesn't match. You're trying to avoid that problem in terms of coming up with a theory. And so you're trying to match as much of the evidence as as well as possible, you know, thoroughly as, as possible without creating any catastrophic um, bad apple piece of evidence, whatever you want, however you want to describe it, a uh, poison pill, inconsistency with some fact. All right, anyway, your theory wholly qualitative as opposed to orthodox science, mathematical qualitative models. So this part is just so annoying because I've been over it and over it and over it. I am not opposed to math and I clearly have rejected any notion that the mathematics is part of their causal evidence. There's no correlation. The only part of the two-slit math, for example, that is relevant or in dispute is what causes the angle sine theta. Every other piece of the um, uh, formula is perfectly rational. Of course the distance matters. Of course the distance from the target matters. All of those variables are perfectly understood as being obviously relevant. The variable that can be contended is the one they say is caused by this Huygens principle. Now it's just an angle. I argue the angles being caused because you hit more electrons close to the surface than away from the surface and that creates more angles of deflection. So that's the probability. So the fact that there's probability involved is agreed to. The fact, obviously the probability being where you land, you know, close to this surface or close to this surface or right dead in the middle and where you land will decide where you go. I think it, it, I could ask Hosseday the direct question. Hosseday, if it were possible for us to aim photons at a precision where we could shoot them right through the middle of the gap without going anywhere near the slit or this slit and just shoot all of the photons right through the middle, do you think there's still going to be a pattern? Or do you think those photons will just go straight through pretty much unmolested? And that there'll be no bars? way way off to the fringes. You might have a couple of bars but no more. What, what do you think the truth would be? Um, so anyway, but I won't get an answer. <laughs> you know. um, uh, qualitative quantitative models. Okay, uh, the orthodox view is that quantitative approaches are more precise. Okay, so again he's saying that there's some reality that mathematics are models and I would argue they're not models and they're certainly not models of causes that's something injected again as stated the only the only variable at issue in the two slit math is the source of the sine theta in Einstein's math there is no bent space math there's just the inverse square law um, converted by Lorenz and then used to do time dilation and to do um, um, a portion of the gravity mixed with Maxwell's um, induction math. There's no bent space in the math. So this idea that their math is representing anything but relationships between the physical variables in the experiment, it's not a description of causes. So it's a description of relationships between the moving bodies. 
and there's no factor in here that has anything to do with their theory regarding the cause. It's just the evidence. So, again, I haven't made any declarations that Einstein's math is fucktarded and stupid. I haven't made any declarations that all mathematics is garbage. I've stated that the two-slit mass doesn't create the pattern that their model suggests it should, and I'm suggesting that's because <laughs> they've put the, in the real mass, they actually put the, I think it's pi cubed um, times something or other, to create the idea of a, a sine wave and a portion of the sine wave, uh, you know, a portion of 360 degrees. But, um, and clearly they're wrong because the pattern isn't a sine wave. Um, doesn't fall that way. Um, so, so again, this is not me against mathematics. And anyone who thinks a mathematical formula, saying the inverse square law as a formula, is defining bent space, I don't know how you can do that. How, how, do you, how do you say that because there's a formula that has a relationship between, say, the diameter of a circle and its circumference, that somehow you can declare that all circles are perfect, or you can make some other um, bold statement regarding the physical reality, when all you have is this little relationship. Yes, the diameter is related to the circumference proportionally by a number. Uh, and that it's not a theory of cause and they just keep doing this they keep forcing me to be in opposition to mathematics when I keep saying there's very few mathematical formulas I have a problem with I'm sure you could cut out half of Einstein's convoluted formula when you have actually understand that all you're doing is induction based on the movement of all the planets and all the planets are creating the procession in the Sun that causes the procession in Mercury. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a simplification of Einstein's math once they get that right. But the whole, the, I'm not declaring the whole fundamental mathematical construct incorrect. I'm not saying there isn't an inverse square law. I'm not saying you can pervert it uh, through a Lorentz transformation into a, um, a, a reverse curve. I'm not saying you can't do any of that stuff. So again, it's just this fake war that their physics is just mathematical when it clearly isn't. Uh, uh, Copenhagen and many worlds and whatever the other one is and uh, dark matter and uh, bent space these, that, that's not math. That's causal declarations. That's not in the math. Right, anyway. Uh, Okay, orthodox view is that quantitative approaches are more precise because of their mathematical predictive power. So let's get to this predictive power thing, another pile of crap. So I would argue that first off, Einstein's math didn't come first. Okay, first there was the speculation of space time, then there was the challenge, you know, in his new orbit theory, and then there was the challenge placed on him. Do you have mathematics for Mer Mercury's orbit? Eddington obliged uh, Einstein to provide him with a model of his mathematics. And then Einstein <laughs> contrived his math to explain the orbit. So he, Einstein knew what he had to make his math explain. So he knew perfectly what he needed mathematics to do. So, but it wasn't like the math came first and then predicted the orbit. So again, understand the history correct first, and second, understand that the math doesn't do the predicting, in 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 the sense that, um, let's see another example. There was nothing predictive about like the idea of light being bent by gravity. That was just a guess. There was no there was nothing in Einstein's theory that obliges light, unlike any other force, to be bent by gravity. He could have declared any force bendable by gravity, but I think he knew that some of them weren't. <laughs> you know, maybe he would have thought magnetism could be bent by gravity. I, who knows? Um, and, but clearly, he guessed at it. And then the experiment was take, take, took place, and the experiment was wishy-washy. But apparently, that was good enough to say Einstein proven right. And once he was proven right, 
it's hard to prove somebody wrong. So again, nobody's going to go back and say, oh, we made a mistake and all that kind of crap. And so we just have this notion. But again, the argument would be is there's if this is what you're calling predictive power, what did he predict? He guessed at something, had weak evidence supporting it, and everybody jumped on the bandwagon. And yet the evidence you have in the world right now is completely inconsistent. You have just as much evidence saying it can't possibly be true because it doesn't exist where it should be. It's not doing what it should be doing if it exists as you do evidence of its existence. And you just ignore those facts. All right. Thus, they encounter the problem of relating abstract models. They're, all models are abstract in the sense that they're drawings of possibilities. <clears throat> so to say they're abstract in the sense of they're their um, Picassos or something and there's no orientation to the truth at all is bullshit. They're maps. We can draw a map of O.J. Simpson's house in his backyard and then we can put O.J. in his backyard for 20 minutes while the limo driver is waiting for him and then somehow he takes a shower even though he's late for the airport and I mean you can you can draw the map. You can draw the model of this is the theory that O.J. was home and he was just jerking off while the limo driver was waiting at the gate. You know, that's the theory. And you can yeah, you can make fun of it. You can draw a picture of it and show how it can't possibly be the right answer. So again, these models aren't, you know, but obviously you can't model something that doesn't have any form. So as soon as they start inventing dark matter or bent space, geometry that makes things move, and you don't have any mechanism at all, and you're just saying, well, what makes this proton in the Earth move towards the sun and you people say geometry tells it to when in every other circumstance this proton doesn't go anywhere okay unless everything around it's going somewhere and it ha usually requires a force in no other circumstance does it just move without there being a force even Feynman will tell you it's not going to move in a magnet unless there's a force hitting it the force makes this the magnets move the virtual photons we don't even have virtual photons in the gravity model Theirs is the abstract model. Mine is the explicit model. Mine is points and dots and real things in real space. There is no bent space. There's no multiverses. There's no multi-dimensions. There's no space-time. There's nothing, none of this. There's no dark matter. Theirs is completely abstract cartoon space. It's, it's dominated by the cartoon space. And mine is dominated by real houses, real grass, real dirt, real roads. So mine is not an abstract model. Oh, anyway, all right. Um, so anyway, so this predictive thing is just bullshit. Thus, they encounter the problem of relating abstract models to real life qual qualitative insights, whatever that even means. Qualitative insights. So let's let's agree that we're not supposed to say insight or perception or view or evidence facts qualitative facts, experiments. So let's go over the quality of the experiments. <laughs> okay, they use and disagree over best metaphors for all of the various models. Well again, we're not arguing various models. We're, I'm arguing the orthodoxy, okay? The thing written, they've written in stone. There are little arguments about string theory or bing theory or wing theory, who cares? I'm not arguing their fringe physics. I'm arguing their shove it down their throats hard physics. I'm arguing bent space and virtual photons as explanations for magnetism and the nuclear forces. I'm arguing with their crap where they borrow energy from the future. I'm arguing with their crap where they say one electron could be the only electron in the entire universe because it just goes back in time all over the place. I'm arguing with those silly models, not the extremely silly crap of whatever little arguments they have amongst themselves about some other fringe notion. I'm arguing <coughs> gravity waves, uh, spooky action, uh, but most importantly, I'm arguing bent space time as the function of gravity and their non existent explanation essentially for magnetism. Those are the biggies I'm arguing. All right. Uh, best metaphors for all their. 
they use and disagree over the best metaphors for all the various models. So again, we're not talking about various models. We're talking about bent space-time. We're talking about virtual photons doing magnetism and the nuclear forces. Um, we're talking about bent space-time, you know, time, bent frames. I, it's clear the stuff I'm saying isn't true. We're talking about whether light is bent by gravity those are the, the subjects under contention. I say string theory isn't even worth the, is, is a waste of time. Uh, it's something dependent on 10 new dimensions being made. I just say that's probably not got any value in, in it at all. And until they make until they show me how string theory makes anything happen rationally without creating magical things again, magical rubber bands tying everything together. Well, why don't they should be able to catch some of those rubber bands somewhere. They should be able to pull them off and show me one once in a while. Anyway, there are some large areas of general agreement and approach, though. And again, what seems the most dominant feature is complete hyperball regarding the integrity of their origin science, which are things like the two-slit experiment and uh, interferometers and um, you know these key fundamental instruments they used 100 years ago to make all of these deductions that I say are fundamentally wrong about what's controlling reality. Uh, but like in the videos I've uploaded, Suskind saying, uh, this is just another, you know, who cares, but anyway, ultimately all metaphors break down. So because Suskind says something stupid like that, I'm, I have to believe it. When all of Suskind's metaphors have pretty much nothing to do with reality, I mean, he describes uh, bent space uh, as a fluid, okay, in the magical sense of an infinite drain and an infinite source. So, uh, why shouldn't that metaphor break down? Because it's a crappy metaphor. It's, it's relying on cartoon magic. So, yes, if you have metaphors that are relying on magic, they'll break down. If you have metaphors that don't rely on magic, uh, dark space, uh, dark energy, dark matter, fake things, then yeah, maybe they're not going to break down. But yes, all of Suskind's metaphors break down. It's because all of his physics is mush. String theory and uh, holographic universe. It's just made up in, in these in vacuous spaces that no one could even this idea that all the information is somehow caught in the event horizon of the black hole. I mean, it's just made up. All right, this is similar to Feynman explaining. See, so here we go. This would be this would be funny. Um, he can only explain magnetism to you if you allow certain things to be true, and what you are capable of allowing to be true is in a large part determined by how mathematically educated you are. It wouldn't matter how mathematically you educated you are, their theory of magnetism has not even any mathematics. I'm sorry, it doesn't. They don't have anything that explains why the magnets move to each other. They have no force. Their virtual photon force doesn't work because they don't know it's polarized. So they can't, they're just saying it must be something like that. That's all they're saying. They don't, they don't have anything that explains why two magnets attract or why two magnets repel. So to pretend that Feynman was doing anything but just trying to avoid having to say, we don't have a great answer, uh, it eludes us. I can tell you it's like something, but uh, that would be wrong because it's really not. It's not like a rubber band, okay? It's like something different than a rubber band, <laughs> okay? But he didn't, he didn't have, it's not like he had an answer and the person would be too stupid to understand his answer, because he doesn't have an answer. And you want to go ahead and show me some mathematical equation that explains the answer, why they attract or why they repel, which it doesn't do, um, then go ahead and offer that. But don't, don't pretend that Feynman was doing anything other than trying to not have to say the words, we really don't have a clue, when that's what he's exactly saying. And yes, it was a very eloquent way of weaseling out of explaining something simple. The guy says, look, it's a simple event. Uh, why does it happen? And he spends five minutes basically explaining why he can't tell you how it happens. Because he can't compare it to something else, right? That was true, right? You can't compare 
the polarized forces to something else because there's none in any other circumstance that work that way. There's no other example in the universe where there's protons and electrons and there's uh, you know positive and negative force around them and forcing you know so there's nothing to analogize or metaphor with because magnetism is a unique function but so is gravity I, I'm just saying you can't compare bent space to anything else that functions in our world it's not going to explain why this flashlight turns on and off it's not going to explain why a pen leaves ink on the paper there, there's no there's nothing to compare bent space to because it doesn't function anywhere else in the universe and that might be evidence of it not being a very good answer is the very fact that oh it only happens in this one circumstance um, so anyway it's just again to, to say that Feynman was doing something besides just weaseling out of the question and not having the courage to say Look, the truth is, we don't have a good explanation for why. All right, anyway. You are starting the other way around. So again, this, this argument that somehow I'm after anything different than anybody else would be after in this circumstance, it's a detective story. We're all supposed to be like Columbo. We go out and we collect the evidence and we evaluate the evidence and we see where it leads and then we start investigating the interesting parts of, you know, once we have a suspect and all that kind of crap. And you're not supposed to be doing anything else and so I don't like this whole implication that I'm doing something else because I'm not doing something else, asshole. All right. Uh, start with descriptive. No, I'm started with the evidence. I started with the evidence of the two slit experiment. I heard these wacky, silly explanations for what was happening, and I said, "There's got to be a better answer than that silly mush." And then I started thinking about photons and what photons are doing, and that led me to think, "Well, what if photons were causing gravity? Invisible photons." And that led me further and further down that rabbit hole of what if I particleize all the forces into one single force? What if I make the same force that causes magnetism, the exact same force that causes gravity, the exact same force that makes light? What if they're all the same thing? And there I had a unification theory. I just fell right into it. But there wasn't any... I had some view and then I made my view fit the evidence thing or anything like that. I just followed the evidence. Oh, fuck. Start with descriptive, perhaps metaphoric model, model. So again, this idea that I'm doing a metaphorical model when I only use metaphors to try to, like I'll use a metaphor for, hey, the the force is, you know, in a circle like a bunch of water buffalo all pointing out and, you know, I'll use a metaphor or an analogy to give you some idea of what the concept, how the concept works, but the concepts are not metaphors. Shit. Um, let's see. Uh, start with a descriptive, perhaps metaphoric model, and don't be troubled. So again, this idea that somehow I'm not troubled with certain things, and I'm just forgetting about it and saying it doesn't worth it bothering. There's none of that happening here. I'm not dismissing or ignoring something. This kind of bullshit again. Just more of this this frickin' tainted rhetoric uh, with whether they explicitly translate to mathematical consistency. So again, I'm saying there's I have no problem with conservational mathematics. I have no problem with the idea of quantized values of energy. I've pointed out what my problem was. I've pointed out quite explicitly. I stated that the photons are discrete bits of energy that they're made out of and that changing their frequency doesn't make them in fact more energetic so you can't use equations where you say energy equals frequency because it isn't true it just equals effect if you shoot the bullets quicker you can knock more stuff over if you shoot them slow you don't knock the thing over so there's a difference in the effect. There's no difference in the amount of energy the bullets have. So I've made these clarifications. And I, I'm quite interested in the mathematics being consistent. So I've pointed out where I agree with the mathematics and where I disagree. So again, this is more bullshit. I've pointed out how all of the equations that use the inverse square law, they really need to pay a little bit more attention to the fact that as two objects move closer and closer to each other, the inverse square law breaks down and a lot of them don't. So, you know, 
Again, more bullshit that somehow math is alien. Uh, I'm not writing new math. I'm not complaining that most of the math already written is poorly written because it's written to describe what happens. It's not written to describe what caused it to happen. So you think the math is written before they see the event. When no, it's written after they see the effect. They're formulating the math to describe effects. They don't formulate math to describe causes. So this is just more nonsense as an argument. This is not me against mathematics. That's not the subject. The argument is my description of causes against their description of causes. Shit. This is bold and risky and can bear fruit. Well, again, none of what I just he said is happening, in my opinion, is happening. There's nothing bold or risky about any tactic I'm making here. I'm saying most of the math is fine. We're arguing causes. He says I'm arguing something else. No, I'm not. I'm arguing causes for effects, not effects. Okay. Orthodox science breeds conservatism as Nima whatever, douchebag frickin' string theory kooky says, um, <laughs> speaks about. Uh, radical conservationism. I mean, it's just conservatism. A bizarre statement when physics jumps at all of these insane uh, magical devices to the rescue. Uh, multiverses, uh, photons with radar, uh, bent geometry, uh, dark matter, dark spa uh, energy, uh, vacuum energy. I mean, all kinds of crap. And he's talking about how that's conservative physics. He thinks gravity waves based on this stupid chirp from an interferometer, this whole speculation about frickin' black holes crashing into each other, that that's somehow a demonstration of conservatism. That they're nine million little, you know, they're hundred little frickin' quirky uh, Higgs bosoni, all that bullshit is somehow conservative physics that they haven't maybe jumped a few sharks in, in their process of trying to get to the next silly particle. Uh, anyway, they're interested in science. What a fucking line. You're just like, fuck that. But they want a career. You can't have both, so that doesn't mean anything. And they're just unwilling to risk such radical, unorthodox approaches. Why? It, it, the Nemo guy doesn't seem to be afraid. Why are you saying all the other physicists are afraid to be as bold as Nemo? Nema, whatever? Bullshit. If they can contrive it to their own purposes, they'd be talking it. But the truth is, most of them don't bother even thinking about it because they've bought all the assumptions. They're completely been brainwashed by the incessant being told, don't think, just calculate. D don't think. You know, just accept all kinds of phantasmagorical explanations. The universe is wacky and probabilistic and woo-woo-y. They've accepted the religious dogma. It's a God universe. Don't bother doing evolution. Just do the God kind of shit. When there are <coughs> um, cleaner avenues and approaches molding the mathematics. Mm. Must have missed something there. Um, Orthodox breeds conservatism. Okay, they're interested in science, a career. Uh, just unwilling to risk such radical, unorthodox approaches when there are career avenues of approach molding the mathematics. Well, again, I would argue to you that if Richard Feynman could, if I could have a secret meeting with him and and show him this theory, he'd like it. All right, and if I would just say, yeah, go ahead, you know, sell it. Feynman could sell it. I can't sell it. But if Feynman came out and said it, people would listen. And that's all there is here. So don't tell me that Feynman couldn't have done it. He just didn't. Don't tell me that Feynman didn't want to do this, because he did. He did want to explain magnetism, and he did want to unify all the forces. And don't tell me Einstein wouldn't love this, because I think he'd love it. All right. Anyway, so so this isn't about scientists being afraid, um, you know, to think outside the box. 
They just don't. Okay, they lack the imagination. They lack. They they're they're in the position they're in because somehow when somebody told them, yes, photons are doing this, and at the same time they're doing this, and yeah, <laughs> you know, through nothing kind. Of, well, there's no ether, but it's like there's fields that they're doing this in, and the other one they're doing this in. Yes, it's the simplest thing in the universe, but yes, yeah, doing this kind of cool thing. And they said, oh, that's so great. What a cool explanation. Where I said, what, what, what am I having three stooges? Uh, where's the, the three stooges going to come in? You know, Curly's going to go spin around the floor or something? Is this some sort of joke? This is your fucking theory of a photon, the most freaking standard, dull, <laughs> dim-witted thing in the universe, and it's got all this complex motion? I'm just saying they bought into it because somehow their thinking was that tell me more fancy stories of flying pigs and I was like a guy who just said no I just don't do this flying pig thing fuck it is that all you got is more flying pigs no fuck it anyway but they want a career blah 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 mathematics anyway uh, that is one very critical way of looking at modern science. So you think that's a critical... He thinks he just criticized modern science when all he did here was say, you don't do enough math, and math is, shows predictive futures. Well, he did say a little derogatory part that, yes, the scientists are a little bit afraid to go outside the box, but I'm just arguing that that's not really true. Suskind's way outside of the fucking box. He's not afraid. He gets plenty of notoriety. The more, if he says black holes, the, the event horizon, um, you know, <laughs> whatever, can smell like vagina, uh, you know, everybody will buy it. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, that is one very critical way of looking at modern science, but it does work. So that's the, that, that line is just so sickening. Um, again, there's, you have nothing to compare it to. It works from your tiny point of view where you've pretended you're not going to look at any other possible scenario. If you would have had some other truth in the universe, who, who knows what would have worked even better. You can't know because you didn't choose the right answer. You're saying choosing the wrong answer works. Well, of course, if you don't compare it to choosing the right answer, it works. I mean... The lemon works as a car if all you're comparing it to is nothing. But if you're comparing it to something better than the lemon, it doesn't work. Shit. That's why it's been done this way for so long. So again, it's just such a, 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 a vacuous argument. The, the, the fallacy of, of because we didn't nuke each other, therefore we had the right social policy. When yeah, you know, no, we could have done a lot better than just not nuking each other. We could have had a whole civilization and monorails and all kinds of stuff. Um, it actually makes logical sense, here we go, to practical, to practice the radical conservatism that is, that uh, Nima pr preaches. So again, this is just, I don't know where he's talking about this guy preaching any kind of conservatism. Um, bizarre. I mean, he's posted videos about the guy. The guy doesn't say anything conservative in the sense that well, he doesn't he doesn't actually go into his whole philosophy of his own fieldy string theory stuff. But there's nothing conservative in what he thinks the truth is. He doesn't think Einstein's right, but, you know, that's about all you can glean. Uh, but this is a separate philosophy of science debate. Yeah, I, it's completely in my, in, in, in a sense, Debating what NEMA stands for would be a conversation because, yeah, we fundamentally don't agree that this guy reeks of conservatism. So I don't know what part of physics you think he's being conservative about. Where he's come out against black holes or gravity waves or bizarre Copenhagen explanations for a two-slit experiment. Where is, he, where is he showing any conservatism? In modern science, we don't weigh evidence so much as just take a binary position how does that even, what do you do with that? A binary position, on or off. I mean, that'll even work. The evidence either fits or it doesn't fit. 
it will be the fits or you have to acquit you know I mean in most cases that's a rational standard you say okay the glove can't be used as evidence because it didn't fit okay <laughs> you know we don't need that you know does it support the posed theory or does it detract well that statement is the one you should have put before your other point where you're talking about how you're you're being critical of science because that's a real problem uh, you know, pretending there's no evidence saying it can't be the right answer, like in lensing. In modern science, we don't weigh. Oh, here we go. There is a weighing of the theory, though, by looking at the extent with which agreement has been found. Okay, now, so he thinks agreeing is the standard, and my argument is logical integrity, honesty. Um, you know, those are the standards. You know, the, the, the jury just agreeing, they agreed in the OJ case, but they were all bigots, right? They already had prejudged the case, and they just ignored all the evidence. So, what good is that? This idea of agreement doesn't mean much. It's what we're after. It's what we have to get to resolve the issue. But I'm not saying they don't have agreement based on of the fact that they had a fair trial first. Where, where do they fairly try my theory? Oh yeah, that, that hasn't happened at all. And where have they even fairly tried any alternative theory that had something to do with a particle theory? Never. When was the fair trial? Never took place. Um, it was dismissed out of hand with simple little remarks like Feynman. Yes, the gravity model fits perfectly as a particle model, except for this one thing, therefore throw it out. So it has one flaw, throw the whole thing out. That's the, that's the evidence of how they conducted the trial. Okay, and the seriousness of failures. Some detracting evidence is deemed, some detracting evidence is deemed optimistically repairable in the theory. Well, see, that's the hypocrisy I keep pointing out, right? So when Feynman dismissed it with the raindrop argument, right, he wasn't being optimistic about, oh yeah, maybe we can fix that problem. No big deal. It's just a little bit of a velocity problem. No problem. No optimism there. So again, the duplicity, the hypocrisy is obvious. They'll give every latitude to the wacky theory and they will destroy in an instant the rational theory, the material theory. So this really is about religion. The more religious it seems, the more wooey it is, the more benefit of the doubt it gets, the more it looks like evolution, it looks sterile, it looks particle, the more that's stomped to death. Anyway, the clear bias. Um, okay, optimistically repairable in the theory. Others understood to fundamentally demolish it. Again, I don't, I don't, the way this is written isn't great. Some detracting evidence is deemed optimistically repairable in the theory. Others understood to fundamentally abolish it. So, again, this idea of abolishing something by what standard? How wooey it is would be my argument. The only thing deciding what they destroy and what they re attempt to repair is how phantasmagorical the bullshit is. All right. If you want to work in this purely qualitative way, so again, I'm not working in some purely qualitative way, whatever the fuck that means, I will refrain from holding you to quantitative standards. Well, again, I'm not afraid of quantitative standards. And again, I, <laughs> I answer questions and then you pretend I didn't do it. So, um, uh, it's just nonsense. I've been over it so many times. You say, well, how does this do this? And I explain to you how it does that. And then somehow you don't understand or, you know, two months later I happen to see say the same shit all over again. So, I mean, I think it's just bullshit to imply that I don't have any interest in going as deep into the details as possible. I'm just saying I would like it to be a fair contest. I'll do twice as much detail as them. But I shouldn't have to do ten times more detail than them. I mean, if you're going to ask regular physics to give you nothing, then geometry, there you go. All solved now, right? The geometry is bending. There, that's what's causing it.
No energy involved, even though it looks like energy. No energy involved. <laughs> I'm saying that's just obvious duplicity. They can have magic forces. I can't. The end. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you also need correcting about my position on modern science. I have made very many detracting videos about quantum mechanics and relativity. Sorry, I mean, everything you do is like this whole commentary here. You imply things and then you counter them with another piece of stuff. And so everything you say that might be positive, you counter with some other piece of crap. So it's impossible. I don't think, in a, if we have a fair trial of Hoffleday's opinions, I'm frankly going to say you're going you're gonna to find that the audience has not appreciated what you've attempted to say because frankly you talk out of both sides of your face. You say there's a flaw in it, then you present a video of somebody arguing for it where they completely use the same bullshit arguments all over again. It's the same lies about what the two slit experiment actually, uh, what the experiment actually is and does. And you just sit there and endorse it. So I, I don't know how you think somebody could have some sort of perception that you are in opposition to this stuff when you're constantly defending it. And that's what you're constantly doing here with me. Um, anyway, um, you also need correcting about my position. So you don't give your position. I can ask you the direct question. Do you think that if you have a slit and you shoot a beam of light right through the middle, so it doesn't go anywhere near the two sides, and, and so if we could do it, if we could make a laser beam fine enough and go right through the middle, do you think that beam spreads? like the traditional pattern. Answer the questions. What do you believe? I mean, you've already done it, though. I mean, you've already sit there and made the argument right to my face. There's proof of this geometry creates gravity. Whatever that means. You're defending it as a theory. The magical geometry does that. The whole interferometer argument started because you were defending their finding of gravitational waves. Shit. That they can see a half of a, the distance of half of a, a, a proton or whatever the fuck they think they can measure. Um, current view of understanding, them, this must not be mistaken for advocating for them. So when I make a video explaining the RA, current view or understanding of one of them, this must not be mistaken as advocating for them. Well, I'm just saying, if I make the argument that they're lying about the two-slit experiment, essentially, that they haven't even watched the experiment, they really haven't analyzed it at all, and they're just talking out of their ass about this whole idea that, you know, a single slit doesn't make a pattern and all that crap. These are d direct misrepresentations of the actual experiment. And then you play a video of the guy saying exactly that. What can that look like other than you defending that nonsense? How else can it be interpreted? Somebody says that's bullshit, and then you play a video of the guy saying the exact bullshit. You know, you say it's a misrepresentation of the facts. You demonstrate it. You show it as best you can by showing the actual images of the experiment, by actually doing the experiment, by saying, look, can't be. Anyway, some of these videos have been, I mean, I show. Uh, Professor Lewin doing it with a variable slit. I show the frickin' pattern, how many bars it has in it. 25, whatever it was in that one. Why are we pretending single slits don't create the same pattern? And then you play a video of somebody denying it again. And somebody's supposed to say you're doing something other than defending their crap? Their propaganda? Anyway, some of these videos have been to a general audience, whatever that means, and some specifically to explain what I see as your misunderstanding of a particular orthodox point of view. Well, again, I, I just call, call that, I'm just calling bullshit on that. Um, and that's, just, that's all I'm going to say. You haven't presented any video where I've somehow um, misunderstood their um, argument in some radical way. So that's just a pile of shit. Um, why do you keep playing those videos by uh, Alka Hammer or whatever the fuck his name is, Jim? They're garbage. It's crap science. So anyway. 
the end. <laughs> so I have written a few little things here. Just you know, I contend that the evidence for the causal declarations is very weak. So I'm not saying the math is weak. I'm saying the explanations for what creates the variables in the math is weak. Below the standard should be required for the degree of stated confidence. So when they state light is bent by gravity, they should have hard evidence, not just a ton of weak evidence. When they say they can detect something called a gravity wave produced by converting matter into geometry, they should somewhere prove they can actually that can actually happen in the universe, that mass is actually converted into geometry. And we don't even have a theory of that. And they certainly shouldn't put Einstein's name on it as if Einstein suggested you convert math, uh, uh, you can convert mass into bent geometry. I contend that standard physics has jumped way ahead of the evidence. So I've been saying that lately. I think it's a good argument, simple argument. They're jumping way ahead of the evidence. Um, I say there are catastrophic inconsistencies in the evidence. Clearly, in the case of the lensing, um, clearly in the case of, I'd say, even in the, the two slit experiment, um, uh, and um, the interferometer is looking doubtful also. I have declared no kind of war or aggression against mathematics. So I'm going to say it again. I am not at war with mathematical formulas. Again, formulas describe events. That's what they write the formula. They see something happen. They describe what happens with the mathematics. They don't describe the cause with the mathematics. Shit. Good mathematics doesn't prove unrelated assumptions. So yes, because you have a good a mathematical formula describing what happens, as Maxwell did, um, doesn't mean uh, everything you think is correct. So Maxwell believed in ether. Doesn't change the fact that his equations are still good. Did Maxwell's good equations prove ether? No, they didn't. So his understanding of cause had nothing to do with the math, because math just dealt with effects. Okay, I say if the theories are compared on a fair equal ground, my theory logically wins. So that's really just the argument. The argument is mine is a uni mine actually unifies all the forces and creates four laws, no dimensions, no extra dimensions between the three physical ones, no, no verses, no bubbles, no fake sources of anything. Um, okay. The fair obligation is to create explanations that are more consistent with the evidence without creating more catastrophic inconsistency. So that's the obligation of a theory. Your theory has to meet the evidence that exists and it doesn't it, it can't create a catastrophic conflict with a strong piece of evidence. And I don't think my theory does that at all. I think it meets a ton of evidence and it doesn't create any problem that's beyond um, um, reasonable speculation that it can be explained in the future. Um, at trial, a good judge or jury fairly weighs the facts, the consistency with the evidence. I don't think the, you people are doing that. Um, how few resorts to magical functions or dimensions is one of the pieces of evidence to consider. Is how many times did they pull out of the invisible man pocket to fix their math? How many times are they creating a, a, a place we can't access? The, Bent space time, the, the dark universe, the multiverse. How many times do they pull the virtual photon? Come on. Their whole theory is dependent on a ton of fake functions and fake dimensions. All right. Now that's enough, I think. Oh, there was one comment on the actual. Um, what do you call it? Yeah, comment page. That's what you call it. So I might as well take care of that while I'm here. Uh, I think it's the only one. It's this one. Come on. Load. All right. So, uh, parapabologic guy. According to your theory, if extremely high frequency gamma ray radiation, light rays, can travel through brick walls, and extremely low frequency radio waves can travel through brick walls, and they are on opposite ends of the electromagnetic spectrum, then why can't light frequencies in the visible spectrum also pass through brick walls? Um, 
so if light is a, the same particle in essence but only different in frequency, why are certain frequencies completely unaffected by physical barriers like brick walls? Well, you know, I could argue why why are, why are all the um, wavelengths being absorbed by this, and why is the red wavelength not being absorbed by this, or just the blue wavelength is not being absorbed by this? I mean, obviously, absorption is a, a kind of complicated in the sense that there's something about the atomic structure that s says the the radiation will be consumed by the electron. The electron will move in a sense, in essence. So when certain radiations hit, the electrons are moved, and the radiation is essentially absorbed in the sense that it becomes part of the atom, um, or it's broken and then creates heat. So a lot of the absorption turns into heat, right? Black isn't really absorbing all the other colors, it's converting them into heat. So it radiates infrared. So it converts the light into another frequency of light. Now, um, so I'm just getting to the point, that's sort of a complex question about what particular atomic structures react to certain frequencies. So they all have, I've stated before, it's, it's not really a harmonic, but they're obviously the tipping points for different atoms. You know, the electrons in different atoms have a different tipping point. That is a point where they'll be ejected. And it takes a different frequency, a different jolt, a different timing of the impacts to bounce them out. You know, if they have to bounce two ways, let's say they had to bounce it against the wall, and then the second time you hit it, it has to be a little bit coming on the rebound, then you hit it again, and that frees it. So if frequency would be critical, depending on what's tying the electron to the other electrons. And that's really what you're talking about here. And the other thing we're talking about is the fact that uh, the atoms are separated. There's lots of empty space. And so some stuff just goes right through and never hits anything. Okay, now with visible light, it doesn't appear that any can get through without hitting something. And so that has something to do with the polarization, that is the thickness of the divergence between the stuff coming. So the stuff coming is a little bit off, you know, based on frequency. So cosmic rays really come right after each other. They're right, they're, they're really right behind each other. Where light, visible light, is more like this, and radio waves are like this. All right, so with that preface, the, uh, what happens when low frequency radio waves are going through a brick wall is they're not exciting any of electrons, so they're just kind of bouncing, so to speak. And so they're sent at such a, all of them at once. So there's a billion of them, and then there's a long two miles, you know, especially for low ones. So there's a billion of them, and then none of them, and then a billion of them. So you can sort of understand that even if you jostled these up a lot and you create a lot of chaos, there'd still be an awful lot of the pattern left when it finally came out. So the pattern would still be really resolvable because there's a billions of them, billions, all of them are right in this packet to start with. And all you do is make that packet a little bigger, but there's still three miles between the next packet. So the frequency is still going to be there. Now with little things, things that are really close to each other, you don't have that flexibility. You can't fuck them up and retain the frequency because any tiny little bit of movement in the wrong direction will lead to a big, big gap in their frequency. So their frequency gets really way off really quickly. So that's why, so I'm just explaining, that's why the low frequency waves get through is because they're really getting interfered with a whole lot, but the frequency is so wide that the interference doesn't matter. It's like being turned into heat. You can still read it. The, the, the photons would still be readable even if they were turned into infrared ones, some of them, because they're still going to be grouped in that big clump. All right, so for the cosmic rays, it's the other argument. There's lots of empty space between the atoms, you know, the little bits, the electrons and the protons. And most of the cosmic rays, you know, they go through, they don't hit anything. And it's not most. So, but the point is they're so energetic in the sense that they're so close together that if one gets through, it's guaranteed that the other one will. So, like with visible light, they're a little bit staggered. So, one half of the light could hit something and the other half could go through. 
but you wouldn't be able to see it at the other end because it's only half of a photon. You can't see it. So the visible light can get half of it broken, but cosmic rays are right behind each other, so less of them get broken. So whatever ones do get through are really easy to see. And they're highly energetic, so it's not like you need 10 of them to show up to be able to see them. You just need one of them to show up, one pair, and you can see it because that's, you know, they're just, it's, it's just easier to see a cosmic ray or an X-ray than it is to see one single photon just because of the fact that the, they're so energetic that if you can make them hit an electron, you'll definitely know they were there. So if you create a barrier they can't get through, um, you'll be able to see their effect, like a metal or something. So the point is, is the cosmic rays go in, there's a ton of them, and only a few get through. So it's not like your argument that all the cosmic rays go plowing right through, but they don't all go plowing right through. <laughs> a lot of them hit something and don't get through. Um, but the point is, is the ones that do get through are going to be intact where a lot of the ones that are a little a little lower frequency aren't intact. Half of them get through but they're not intact so you can't see them as their original frequency. <sighs> that was sort of a long explanation. Um, anyway, I don't mean this question as an attack on your theory. I'm just curious to see how your explanation of the phenomena compares with and contrasts with that of cons conservation conser Conventional physics. Without getting into too much detail, conventional physics basically claims that the medium is transparent to a wavelength it cannot absorb. So again, absorb is a tricky word because this this isn't really absorbing black. Right? I mean, we all know that if I put black out in the sun, it gets hot. So it didn't really absorb the radiation. It converted it into infrared radiation. Uh, it converted it into noise. <laughs> you know, um, uh, conventional physics basically claims that, that the medium is transparent to a wavelength it cannot absorb due to a relationship of electromagnetic resonance. So again, I would argue that's probably going higher than you need to go. I don't think that we see this as black because photons hit it and then it turns black because it starts vibrating at the at that frequency. So I don't think there's some vibrating frequency that decides what color this is. Um, so I don't really buy that argument. Um, phase distribution of electric and magnetic wave amplitudes. So again, I don't think you need any of that stuff. It's just that the atoms have electrons that require specific ways to tip them over. Every, every pole, if I make the pole thicker or I make the pole taller, how to tip it over changes. How many baseballs, how, what, what rate you throw the baseballs to tip it over changes for every kind of physical dynamic and every place you hit it. So it's just that the atomic structure is different for the electrons in terms of their balance and their, their, their how well held into the atoms they are. And that's really all the argument is about, is how do you jostle the electron enough to absorb the photon, either destroy the photon or for the atom to capture its energy. All right, um, and I mean destroy by converting into another frequency, that is letting it hit and it reflects and then the second one hits a different thing and it reflects at a different rate. So you change the frequency. So it was this and you change it to this. All right, um, phase distribution of electric and magnetic wave amplitudes and band gaps in wave propagation. So again, that is a, you know, obviously you have to say that in brief because there's no way to s explain it in detail, but it sounds pretty complicated, and yes, that might be their theory. I don't know how much evidence they have to defend it, but I think that still the basic argument is, is number one, absorption is one thing. That is, your, the energy goes actually into the, the object itself. Uh, conversion is another thing where you, the energy goes in in one form and it leaves in another form. Um, and going through, that is being broken, so you can't see it anymore as the form of energy it was because you've broken the frequency, then it basically just leaves its gravity. And, you know, so there might be plenty of it, but obviously to detect gravity, you need a lot of gravity to move something. So the amount of energy from a photon isn't going to make much of a gravitational difference. It's in fact, not going to make 
any difference that you can detect because the number of photons is so much smaller than the number of gravitons in the universe so it's just it, photons don't move things very well and as gravity even if I converted all the photons from this light bulb into gravity it wouldn't move this pen any more than the light did light is an incredibly weak manifestation of force it just happens that electrons and protons are really sensitive to light so light looks like a strong force when it's incredibly weak in its amount of energy compared to magnetism and gravity all right so that's probably enough all right so till the next time and such do I ever press the button to turn this video on? I don't know, so long ago. Ah, apparently I did. Okay, good. Wouldn't want to do this one twice. So, thank you very much. And uh, comment if you feel like it. Um, on the general subject, I suppose, of what do you think it is to try facts? You know, to, to do the Columbo thing. To go into the world and say, what is the truth? There's a dead body. There's a gun, there's footprints, there's a car engine, there's certain things around us that we can see as evidence, and um, isn't really the job here is to find the best way to tie that evidence together. And if you think doing it with glue, like dark matter, and empty answers like, well space just happens to bend exactly the same way the inverse square law requires it to. It just happens to create a bend that's exactly like the inverse square law. I mean, isn't that just too convenient? Come on.